بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في البداية نرحب بالحضور الكريم ونشكركم على تفاعلكم الدائم مع أنشطة الجمعية باسمي وباسم أعضاء مجلس إدارة الجمعية الاقتصادية الكويتية نرحب بسيد أندرو بول مدير التنفيذي لشركة شمال الزور شركة شمال الزور اللي تأسست في أواخر سنة 2015 برأس مال 110 دنانير عفوا 110 ملايين دينار كويتي كلنا نعلم أن الشركة مطروحة للاكتتاب الاكتتاب اللي راح ينتهي إن شاء الله في نهاية شهر ديسمبر القادم مستر بول It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, though I think all the audience are eager to hear about the company. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Mashri, um, again, I repeat, thank you very much for inviting me here. And it's, uh, it is indeed a, a pleasure to, uh, to address, uh, address the Kuwaitis, especially at such a time as hopefully most of you will know, there's a, a share subscription going on for the company. So I more than happy to, to come and tell people a little bit about who we are, what we do and what our plans are for the future, a little bit about the technology behind the plant and of course um, give you where I feel we are with the, uh, with the, share, with the share distribution. Thank you. I think that should be okay. As I say, um, again, Meshuri, thank you very much. I, I see this as a, as a great opportunity. Um, I will try and speak slowly because I'm aware I'm also being translated by Marwan in the box over there. Thank you very much, Marwan. And I'm also I'm very privileged to see I'm being supported by three of my, four of my staff on the front row here. So if there's something you don't understand and you feel more comfortable addressing any of my colleagues in Arabic after the presentation, please do. I have, uh, I have Fahad, Fawaz, Mohammed and uh, Fahad as well, who can, are more than happy to explain exactly what the company uh, does and who we are. I'll begin. So, we are Shamal Azor Alula. I hope that's uh, clear. Um, we are the first, and again, that, that alone, we are the first privately owned, independent water and power plant in Kuwait. Um, I'm obviously presenting to the Kuwait Economic Society. And let's just, before we go on, let's talk a little bit about the project itself, the, imp the implementation phase. Um, the, the whole reason we're here is there is a, a, a legal framework and a private uh, a PPP policy, PPP Law 116 and the IWPP Privatisation Law. This is the legal framework that underpins exactly why we're here. Um, the project itself is a Greenfield BOT. BOT means build, operate and transfer. I have a 40-year contract, energy conversion and water purchase agreement with MEW, with the government of Kuwait. The BOT means after 40 years, I actually transfer the power station over to the Kuwaiti authorities. My main off-taker, as it says there, is the Ministry of Electricity and Water. I have a, a close working relationship with all the guys at MEW and within PSPD. And as I say, we've been here for three years now and we've envisaged no significant problems. Just some key dates and some key figures for you. Financial close was in um, January 2014. The project total cost roughly $1.7, $1.8 billion. We generated first power shortly after in May 2015, first water in February 2016, and project commercial operation slightly just over just under three years ago on the 26th of November and again that's a figure we're also very proud in because the project was on schedule it's in the construction industry it's not often that a project of such complexity finishes on time we did something we're very proud of people have asked me how big is the power plant it's it's contracted capacity is about 1520 megawatts this on a, on a good day is about nine nine ten percent of Kuwait's power there's, there are times of the year when we have been known to produce up to 15 to 20 percent of Kuwait's power, depending on what all the other power stations are doing. Um, why are we here? Well, you can see this is data taken straight from MEW's own tendering uh, documents. You can see there's a fairly steady projection that over at least till 2025, there's expected to be a 6 percent growth year on year in power. Again, these are MEW sourced figures. 
Um, but you can see it's a fairly linear growth going out to 2035. What drives this demand for power is I think everybody in Kuwait knows. There's a, there's a lot of intended investment into infrastructure, uh, development of new residential areas, infrastructure and industrial facilities. The capacity forecast for MEW, I think you can see um, the capacity is intended there, probably around 2021, 20, 22 is, is intended to ramp up. But you can see 2020, there's probably a slight issue there that the capacity may struggle to meet demand. But I know MEW have many contingency plans to, to make up any gaps. The ramp up there will be when phase two and three come, which I'll talk to you about later on. Water, again, we produce water. We produce 107 million imperial gallons per day. That, again, on average is about 17%, but on certain days we have been known to provide 20 to 25% of Kuwait's water is generated from Shamal. Again, the demand for water, as again, figures from MEW, it's about five to seven percent year on year. Again, these figures are taken straight from MEW's own tendering documents. Capacity for water, again, will be fairly, fairly uh, capacity forecasts, sorry, for, uh, for water supply are in line with MEW's own forecasts of when they want to bring on the new power, power facility, the, the new water production facilities. Where are we? We are located about 100 kilometres south of Kuwait City. You can see we're first of five phases. We are as a north phase one. The intention is there will be two, three, four and five. Um, we are sat right next door to Azor South. And all the other facilities I've highlighted there are the, the principal power stations. You can see they're all distributed along the coast within Kuwait, Sabia, Shuwaiba, and Shuwaik, and Azul South. A little bit on the project structure. This is quite a complicated slide, but nonetheless, it's, it, it's quite a, a relevant slide. So we are Shamal Azor. Who, who owns Shamal Azor? Well, as you can see, we're 50% owned by Kuwaiti citizens, or will be shortly, 10% by government entities, being PIFs, the Social Security Fund, and also KIA. The company in the middle is the Azor North One Bidding Company, and they are owned by the foreign investors, so they own 40%. 40% is owned by foreign investors, 60% is owned by the state of Kuwait, between government entities and the public. Both of the relationships are obviously governed by various shareholder agreements and contractual ties. Some of the key contracts I also have is an operations and maintenance agreement. I, I employ a separate operations and maintenance company, Azor North Operations and Maintenance Company. I also had a separate contract with an EPC contractor to build the power station. And importantly, this little arrow here is an LTSA contract with GE of America. We have a very, very close relationship with GE because they are our key technology providers and I have a slide from GE later on. Probably my key contract is my ECWPA. This is a 40-year contract with MEW and a land lease agreement. This is what really does dictate how I get paid, what I need to do over the next 40 years and my relationships with MEW. The fuel, interestingly enough, is not provided directly to the company. The fuel, as I say, it's an energy conversion contract and the fuel is provided through MU. And lastly but not least, these guys on the bottom here are my financiers. Um, the, the, the type of financer we had is project finance. And the more I spend time in Kuwait, I realize that project finance isn't as, um, isn't as popular as in Western Europe or other parts of the world. So I've got an extra slide just to explain a little bit about project finance. But the guys on the bottom there, J Japanese banks, Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi, uh, BTMU, JBIC, those are our main financiers, along with MBK. So moving on, again, I said I would just explain what is project finance. This is the IPFA definition. And you'll see if the PPP policy moves forward, all of them will be financed along the same lines. So this is what is project finance. It's the financing of long-term infrastructure in, for industrial and public services based on non-recourse finance. What is non-recourse? Well, that means that the only collateral the banks can go for in the event of default is the power station itself. Um, the financial structure where the project debt and equity are used to finance the project are paid back from the cash flows. 
So my company generates cash flows into the future 40 years and that's what the financiers, what my debt providers are, are relying on. Again, just to, just to stay on the issue of project finance, those are my senior lenders. So these are the guys who provided me 80% of my company's debt. Um, and then the, the, one of the key issues with project finances is you do ha lose a little bit of the flexibility because the lenders, the lenders have then a lot of security and a lot of involvement with the contract. So the point is, what do the lenders care? Number one, will the plant produce enough cash to pay? The technical risks, financial risks, economic risks, fuel risks, and does the plant comply with overall environmental standards, and does the company comply with law? These are the, these are the issues that I mainly address with the lenders on a day-to-day -day or monthly basis. My relationship with the lenders is defined under a common terms agreement, and there's also a shareholders direct agreement with the bidder co-shareholders. A little bit of the sizing of the funding. You can see there's three key tranches there for the funding. We have a JBIC facility of 624 million, a commercial uh, facility agreement of 489 million, and a Nexi covered tranche of 274. That's about the 1.4 billion. The remaining 300 is, comes from obviously from equity. I also have interest rate hedges. Again, we're looking at future con uh, 40 years of interest rate risk. So this risk is mitigated while placing interest rate hedge, hedge contracts. And we also have a small working capital facility with MBK. Um, further on the financing, um, there are a number of security agreements. So what happens if the project comes into default? Very simply, very, very simply, the banks, the lenders can step in and take over operation of the plant. They can take over and step in. They have various stepping rights in all of the contracts. How does this work? Very simply put, there are direct agreements should the project start to have any issues, the banks can step in and take over the relationship with MEW via the ECWPA. They can take over the relationship via the EPC direct agreement or they can also take over the O&M the uh, contract with a direct agreement. This, the whole point of this is to realise that the financiers need security, they need the peace of mind that the debt will be repaid. There's no risk of not paying the debt and interest. So the contract, whilst very, very restrictive, are also very, very necessary. A little bit on how we make our money. This is a question I've been asked a few times. They say, Paul, how do you make your money? We, we actually charge a tariff to MEW based on capacity, i.e. how big is the power station. It costs us money to invest and to build the power station. So there's a fixed payment for, for power and water. And that's basically there to allow us to pay our debt and to service our interest. And also to pay an equity return to the shareholders and any taxes and any other duties. And there's also another component for the fixed component for payment for power and water to cover costs of operation and maintenance, insurance, staff, spare parts. This is a very, very conventional approach throughout the GCC. You'll see this in the UAE, Oman. It's not really unique in, uh, in that respect. And there's also variable payments, a variable payment that varies with the levels of output. Should we produce more water, we consume more chemicals. Should we produce more power, we consume more gas, more spare parts. The last component there is probably a little bit more interesting. There's a fuel adjustment component, uh, which is based on a, calcul on, on a model where the theoretical fuel consumption is compared to the actual fuel consumption. And any variance in that, we are paid a fuel bonus or a fuel penalty. So we're, we're incentivized to operate the plant as, mo as, as efficiently as possible. This is the organization. It's a fairly small organization. That's myself at the top. I have a CEO and a CTO. I actually have four guys of the company down here. Um, so we're a very lean, small organization in, the, uh, in our head office. We have a significant organization, or a, a separate company in fact, AZNO and EMCO based in the site. Currently have about 123 staff, and you can see it's split a typical power station between operations, maintenance, engineering, human resources. Um, what, is, what is a combined cycle power station? I think this diagram quite, quite, sums it up quite neatly. We have five gas turbines, as I mentioned, they're GE gas turbines, and I'll show you 
a gas turbine very shortly because that really is the heart of the power station. We have four heat recovery steam generators, two steam turbines, also provided by GE, and then 10 MED units. This is a gas turbine. In fact, this is our, the heart of the plant. This is our GE frame 9F series 0903 pack 5 gas turbine. I have a nice video which will help explain exactly how gas turbines work. I know I'm talking to economists, but uh, there's a very short video in a minute, two minutes long, which will hopefully give you some basic education <laughs> into how power stations work. Um, the gas turbine has a nominal output of 255 megawatts. Um, and as I say, I have five, uh, 228 megawatts. And as I say, I have five of these gas turbines on the plant. I'm just going to show you a very, very short video. I hope it's two minutes long. I know I'm talking to economists, but at least it will explain the principles behind the power station. If there's some sound. I apologize, there's, uh, there's no sound, is there? I will stop that. If there's no sound, I don't think we, we, we will do that. I apologize. Um, but it it's basically just explains how the principles of a gas turbine works. Um, I will move on. I will move on. I apologize about that. So we also have, as I said, we have five gas turbines and two steam turbines. The steam turbines are also 255 megawatts rated. I have, as I say, I have five gas turbines and two steam turbines. These two key slides are the real heart of the power station. And I said about the lenders having technical risks, and this is what we spend a lot of time making sure this equipment is maintained to an extremely high level of availability and reliability. We invest a lot in making sure these units stay online, making sure we're available, and making sure we're reliable to provide power. This is our MED unit, multiple effect distillation. Again, simply put, this is where we convert the seawater into demineralized water. It's a vacuum process with using low heat exchange taken from the combined cycle. Each unit has about 48,000 tons per day, converted times 10 and converted into millions of imperial gallons is 107, 108 imperial gallons. Again, my intention isn't to go too much into the technology, but what I will tell you is again, these units are very, very efficient, very, very well maintained using the latest materials and the latest efficiency upgrades. There are also a whole host of other balance of plant items. The, plant, the power plant itself is very complex. And I'm conscious I'm talking to economists, so I, I will not go into any great detail into what all the other components of the plant are. But I will say that we have a very, very complex control system, a very, very modern state-of-the-art control system that looks after the efficiency and also the environmental emissions within the power station. There's, a, there's an overview of the power station. Uh, this is an artist's impression. Um, some of the key buildings, we have a small administration building, a workshop where we have about, I think at the moment we have almost $50 million worth of spare parts in there. Uh, we have a turbine hall where we house the, uh, the gas turbines and the steam turbines. We have the, the HRSGs, if you recall from the plant concept diagram, and then the 10 MED units are at the back there. Uh, the plant there on the end is interesting, that's the potabilization plant where we change the, uh, the raw remineralized water, we potabilize it to make it drinking water. You can actually drink water from the outlet of our, of our plant there. It's of potable quality. A little bit, again, I'm asked Paul, how has the performance been? Uh, we're just getting the 2019 figures now. They're due very shortly, but I do have the 2018 figures. And you can see we have budgeted forecast against availability. And even without going into the figures, you can see that we've exceeded the blue are always above the blue line. I think we had one bad month in November where we didn't quite meet budget. But generally, we're, we're expecting the 2019 figures probably not to be as good, but nonetheless still, still within budget. Again, I, I also mentioned, how, how do we, when I tell you that, how do we benchmark ourselves? I work for NG and we have a lot of power plants in, throughout the Gulf, but we benchmark ourselves with our other power plants in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And you can see on the far left there, that's Azor North. We're actually nine, we have some of the highest 
sustainability uh, figures for our power plants within the region. Which I should be very proud of. That it is a very, very highly well-maintained, highly efficient, highly available power station. Um, future PPP projects. Um, MEW have launched, or they did launch, uh, the technical advisor for phase two and three. As I say, phase one, we are the first of five phases. Phase two and three is an even bigger project, 2,700 megawatts and 165 million gallons. Um, this data will probably need to be confirmed by MEW, but probably the first quarter or the second quarter of next year, requests for quotations will go out, followed three months later by the RFP. This is obviously, this is um, data that I've taken from MEW and will need to be confirmed by them. There's also Al Qiran, another huge power project, um, which will be developed slightly after two and three, 1,800 megawatts and 125 million gallons of capacity. Um, both these projects have already been out there in the market and I know my company and many other companies are very interested in keeping uh, are bidding for these projects. Um, I'm always asked, Paul, where are we with the share distribution and the listing? So I'll maybe just spend some time going through this slide. Um, first of all, the share distribution is being managed by CAP, the Kuwait Authority for Public-Private Partnerships. Um, there is a website. I, uh, if you haven't seen it, please feel free to go on it. Uh, I've both of the links there, ipo.com.kuwait. Um, have a look and that will give a lot more details and some of the data I presented to you now you will see on the website. Um, I've mentioned to you already that the share distribution is as we speak still open. It was open on the 1st of October and will stay open until midnight on the 29th of November. Again there is a, a, a website to, to, um, to, to actually make your applications on via website or you can download IPO Kuwait from the Apple Store and you can purchase shares via your iPhone if you so wish. Um, what's being distributed is 55 million is a half of the company's share capital. I have 110 million dollars of capital, million KD of capital, sorry, KD, and we're distributing 55 million Kuwaiti dinars worth of share capital. Um, and this is available to every Kuwaiti national who is registered on the PASI, on the PASI database. Every living Kuwaiti can, can subscribe. Um, the, the tranches or the shares can be purchased at the, a, a minimum subscription of, I think it's 38.7 KWD, uh, all the way up to 2,000 KWD. That's 20,000 shares or 387 shares. All the shares are 100 fills par value. Um, I understand even though the process is being run by CAP, I can see from the press and what I'm told that the demand so far has been good, um, despite some strange press coverage. I think uh, we've had some, uh, some, some, some issues with it within the press, but um, as I say, the share distribution as far as I'm told is, 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 uh, is good. Um, company listing after we've distributed and the shares and the um, and Kuwait Clearing Company have updated the shareholder register there's a period of time that allows for my company and my guys to list the company with the with the Bourse of Kuwait uh, there is a process where we've used MBK Capital as our advisors and we've got an overview of the listing requirements and now we're preparing ourselves to hopefully make the time from distribution closure to listing as short as possible but with all the best intentions, I think it will be the end of the first quarter in 2020. That's what I can tell you about the share distribution. Um, if there are any questions at all, I, I, I will gladly answer them. Again, but I also have, I have five members of my staff now as well. I see uh, Abdullah's turned up, so that's really good. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions at all. I apologize about the video. I forgot there was sound on the video, Mishuri. But um, if there are any questions, I am absolutely more than more than happy to, to answer them. Uh, thank you. Can you tell us more about uh, your future plan of distribution, the dividend that you're going to pay it out, what you're going to retain from the dividend, and is the cash flow just stable or going to have a growth element 
as well as the growth element in terms of the distribution of the dividend? It, 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 it's a good question. Um, again, how, how, how I can answer this and how I can only really answer this is it's a, it, it's, um, a utility stock. It's a defensive stock by, by nature. If you look at utilities, especially in, 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 in Western Europe, they are less volatile than other sectors of the industry. Uh, they're basically fixed. They're a, a dividend yield play. Are they a growth? No, because we have a fixed contract. I have a 40-year fixed contract with MEW. I have my land lease agreement with a, with, a, with a plot of land. So can I extend the project and can I grow the project itself? The answer is physically no, because it's constrained by my, by my contract with MEW. I have a 40-year uh, single off-taker contract, so there's no market risk. You know, my, my, my customer is a single off-taker, so there's no exposure to any, any merchant risk or market risk. Um, so, as a stock, is it a growth stock? No, it, it, it would be described as a defensive dividend-based stock. Um, and obviously, utility sector, by its very nature, is less volatile. It's not cyclical. It doesn't go with the business cycle. Power, power by its very nature, is, is very steady. Almost, you could say it's characterised as a fixed income, as a bond. I hope that answers you. So as a percentage-wise, are you targeting 5% annually or...? That, that, again, because we, we, we're about, we will be paying, I, I, I think I can say that, we will be paying a maiden dividend uh, once we're listed, but for the future dividend payout ratio going forward hasn't been decided. That will be a board-level decision. and a board, all I can say is that within our articles, it's obviously to maximise return to shareholders. But what that means is obviously that would be a board, a shareholder decision as well. You're right. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was a bit late. I missed part of the presentation to traffic. Uh, I might have missed uh, the answer to my question. Now, as, assuming you're going to be producing power, and selling it to the government, is that how uh, has uh, the rates, the prices, etc., has been uh, agreed with the government? Uh, I, I don't know if this has been discussed. No, that, that's, that, that's a good question, yeah. I had a small slide about the tariffs, but um, yeah, what, we, what tariffs we charge for MEW are all clearly contractual. Within, within the energy conversion and water purchase agreement. Those tariffs are based on the levels of electricity and water we produce. So there's an agreed tariff at year one for all the various components of the tariff on the slide. So that would be the capacity payment, the fixed O&M payment, the variable O&M payment, and any fuel adjustment payment. Uh, so agreed with the government? Agreed, yes, yes, agreed at day one with the government. And then they are indexed or adjusted over the life of the contract, again, with a purely transparent, agreed indexation formula. I see. Okay. Regarding phase two and three, Will you do? Uh, will you raise capital separately, or it will be uh, by default link from the first phase, where uh, uh, the owner of the first phase gonna increase the capital? That, that again is a is, is a good question. Ju just to be clear, the Azor North development is done in five phases. My company and my consortium, we won phase one only. There's no guarantee that we will win phase two, three, or four. We, there will be a separate bidding process with other companies, with other suppliers, with other consortia, with other developers for the future phases. So, as I say, my contract is for phase one, and that's the one I have for 40 years. Would we be in a position, would, would my consortium bid for phase two and three would be a decision made by the consortium members? I would like to think they did. They, sorry, I would like to think they would because we spent a lot of time developing relationships within Kuwait, understanding Kuwait, because Kuwait isn't so easy to understand all the time. So I would like to think they would, but that would be an, in, an investment-based decision that my shareholders would take. So phase one is a standalone contract. Two and three, it could be a totally, there could be another person talking to you presenting two and three. Uh, thank you, Mr. Andrew. Um, just so I can clarify again the point uh, the gentleman just said. So Azor al-Ula, first of all, 
there is no direct exposure or bidding to phase two, or right? It will be your consortium, not the shareholders of Shamal Zor or Lola, who will be bidding into uh, Correct. Zor. Correct. So that's a totally different different entity by your consortium, not yes. exposed by. Yes, it will. That, that's correct. It will be a separate. The structure I've shown to you there is for phase one. There will be a separate project company, separate EPC, different EPC, different shareholders. It will be a, a totally, you're 100% right, a totally separate bid project with no relation, potentially no relation between the two phases. Um, another question. Of course. Right now, as you mentioned, it's a, let's say a steady dividend payout co company instead of like a growth. Is there any potential of it, like the company Standard Azor, expanding into a different business internationally, into the power sector? Are there any um, aspirations for it or any, uh, yeah, good like question. let's say, uh, increase shareholder value yeah. instead of like considering it like a bond payment, you know, that, simple terms. That's a great question. Again, I repeat, so Shamal Azor is, a, is, a, is an SPV or a project company set up for Shamal Azor. Shamal Azor has its own contract and it, 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 it will not expand because, number one, the ECWPA, the contract I have with MEW is a single supply. I can only sell my power to MEW. I, for instance, I cannot sell it to KMPC or KOC or an industrial facility. The power I produce is dedicated for MEW's distribution to the, to the Kuwaiti public. So there's no growth, shall we say, in, in expansion. I, Shamal will not be expanding. All we will do in future years will be focusing on keeping our costs tight, keeping the plant efficient, and keeping the plant very, very well maintained. Which is why, you know, we have um, GE of America, you know, where they're some of the best turbines, best service providers in the market. So that's what our focus will be. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, speaking of uh, being uh, costly and the maintaining profitability, we want to go back on the tariffs charged. So are they uh, fixed or uh, floating or are they set every year uh, between you and the government? Again, I have, a, I have a contract, I have an index linked tariff. So at year one, the, there's, we won the project based on a tariff, correct? Whenever you bid competitively, it's the lowest levelized tariff that wins provided there's technical compliance as well. So at year one, there's an agreed tariff for power and water, and that's where we win the project. But then obviously as costs escalate over the years, it's indexed to consumer price indexes, to producer price indexes, and there are formulas that allow indexation over the years to allow for changes in costs over the years. And that's it. So my, my, my tariff is fixed at the start, and then we'll just escalate with indexation over the period of the contract. There's no options for renegotiation of tariff for it's a fixed, levelized cost of electricity based tariff. Okay, thank you. Going back on the same issue, yeah. uh, would you, uh, do you realize that the consumption of power in the winter is uh, uh, much less than the summer? Uh, has this been taken into account or are they going, is the government going to buy the same quantity all over the year or, or how? That, that, that again is a, is a very valid question. Because we are the, the newest and the largest power plant in Kuwait as of today, as of North Phase 1, because we benefit from that very latest technology, so we are the most efficient. So MEW obviously have gas limitations on where they can allocate their gas. So they will allocate their gas to the most efficient power stations. As far as I'm aware, again, we have GE technology in there. We know, or I know what the efficiency of my power station is, and so do MEW. So what you find in the winter, when some of the other older power stations are being maintained and shut down, from our operating history for the last three years, we have still been very highly loaded, almost 95% almost loaded, because it, pro it, provide, it proves to be cost efficient to have the most efficient plant running rather than have us shut down. I hope that explains. So, as, as I said, we're benefiting from being the latest and the newest. When future phases two and three come along, then maybe as or North's demand will, because they'll look for the most efficient power station when two and three and four come along. But at the moment, three years, We've at least got, what, maybe two, three more years before there's a new power station, if you allow for bidding and construction. So in the short term, Shamal Azor will still be very heavily loaded and still be the most efficient. 
How about buying the gas? Uh, I assume you're going to buy it from the oil sector, or is it going to be imported? That's, again, if you look on the structure, we have, this is slightly different from some parts of the region, we have an energy conversion and water purchase. So the energy, the fuel, is given to us. I have no separate fuel supply contract with KOC or KMPC. The fuel is provided through MEW to Shamal Azor. So I have no separate fuel supply agreement or natural gas supply agreement. But the plant is predominantly natural gas fired and it's provided by, by KOC. I mean, have you been assured of the supply uh, a stable supply of gas for the project over the 40 years? Uh, we, all I can tell you, well, you never know what's going to happen 40 years down the line. Mm -hmm. all, all I can see is what I see being developed by KOC is we've had three years of operation with zero interruption in gas. I think there's been some variations in pressure when there's been uh, LNG import or where they've been using on, uh, onshore gas. But we've had zero interruptions in, in gas. So we've had reliable fuel gas supply for three years. I can only assume when the KIPIC facility and the LNG import facility is built, the risks of um, having any fuel gas interruptions will be, will be minimised. In fact, the KIPIC facility is adjacent to uh, Azul North and Azul South. So the security of fuel supply should be improved e e even what, better. What about the price of fuel? To you, uh, has this been agreed upon? Is it going to be? I, I, I know that uh, the oil sector charges the MEW at international rates. Yes. Uh, and are they going to be charging you international rates or any subsidized rate? Well, again, a great question. But again, I repeat, we have an energy conversion. I have no fuel supply contract. So any price exposure on fuel, my company has no fuel price exposure. MEW give me the energy, not for free, but they give me the energy, and then I convert that to water and power. So I'm not, I don't have that fuel price risk. Oh. So I do see what the prices are because we, we check it for our own records, but we're not exposed to fluctuations in fuel price. Okay. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, if you can give us some ratios like return on equity, return on asset, debt to equity. Uh, and the second question is shutdown for maintenance. How frequent and how that one affects your uh, uh, regular services? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I, will, I, I, I don't have the, the ROA. Do you say ROA, ROE figures? I don't have those figures in, in front of me. Our DE, our DE ratio is, is obviously linked to our project financing documents. Our DE at the moment is 80, I think it's 7921, 80-20 uh, debt, debt to equity. It's heavily indebted. That's the whole purpose of, of bringing in project finance. And it obviously leverages the foreign investors' returns. You know, we have 20% equity, 80% debt. But what do we give up? for having this 80% debt is, as I mentioned, is, is, is a, a lot of control. I have to do a lot of reporting to lenders. Lenders have tremendous access to step in. If they don't think, if they see there's a risk in me not repaying my debt or me not repaying my interest, they have the rights to step in and take over. How, has this happened in reality? No, because we know what we're doing. You know, we're, we're a good company, but that's the benefits of having project finance. It's, um, you give away some flexibility for the lower cost of finance. So the DE is 80-20. Um, what do we do during shutdown? We have a, for the next 40 years, believe it or not, there's a schedule in the contract where we tell MEW each summer when we're going to be shut down. We know from the technology we have, again, I keep referring to GE, I know every single year when I need to shut my gas turbines down. It's like your car. If you take your car, you have a service record. Every 50,000 miles, 100,000 miles, 150, we can then predict and, and, and we forecast for when these outages are. And then we subsequently budget for those outages and we inform MEW one year in advance, six months in advance to tell them this winter, this machine is down for its maintenance. Then this machine, then this. So we have a very, a very good, accurate position. So we know exactly where our revenues are going to be. We know exactly where our, our output's going to be. And we know exactly when our maintenance of the gas turbines is going to be. So that's why, again, when I say we're a very steady stock, there's no shocks. In theory, there's no shocks. It's not retail or pharmaceutical. It's utility sector. Very, very steady, very steady. Are you planning to do like SABIC, where you 
give dividend out every quarter? You're asking me dividend payout. Um, I, I believe, in fact, I may be right, I think the company's law has been recently changed in Kuwait yes. where that allows for interim dividends. Exactly. Um, so that's recent. Um, again, that will be a board issue whether we pay interim every six months. I don't, we haven't paid a dividend yet. Yep. Hence, that's why everybody's very keen you know, that, that we move through the share distribution. Again, we have been operating for three years, and I, because the share distribution hasn't been completed, I still haven't paid a dividend, so that may give some people an idea of so do a, you have, a, have a lot of cash. Do you have a figure around what you're going to uh, pay in the first dividend, for example? I, I, I can't really say that. I, I, again, people are purchasing the shares. I, I, you, the, the financials are in the prospect, are, in the, are, on, are, are on the website. Um, if you look at the data in there, the three years financial, I, again, I haven't paid a dividend for three years. That's, you can see that on the... Thank you. So, yeah. question. Do you consider this your plant as a green plant? Is it safe for the environment? Yeah, uh, again, uh, uh, if you saw one of the main stipulations with the lenders, especially Japanese lenders, they're, they're very, um, I won't say aggressive, but they're very keen on having the very highest of environmental standards, especially for emissions to atmosphere and emissions to water. And again, it's one of the reasons why we try and pick the very latest technology, because the highest technology often gives you the lowest emission levels. So the turbines themselves, uh, again, are provided by... I'm not Gina. sure of the fuel you're using. Which, which fuel? Is it gas? Yes, Liquid gas? Uh, yes, yes, it's gas fuel, yeah. Natural oh. gas fired, yeah. We do have some emergency backup fuel. If, there's, if there is an interruption in the fuel gas, for okay. whatever reason, then we can run on backup fuel, but that is only for emergencies, should the gas pipeline break off, for instance. So we're a natural gas fire power station. We fire on either LNG, if the LNG is being imported into Kuwait, or from onshore Kuwaiti produced gas, we have options. Um, again, coming back to the emissions, yeah, obviously the beauty of using natural gas is it's a much cleaner fuel than coal. It's much, much cleaner than oil. Um, and if you compare that with the very latest of combustion standards for gas turbines, how they combust the gas and keep the flame very lean to limit the sulfur dioxides and the carbon dioxides and the carbon monoxides, keep these emissions very, very low. And I report every, I think it's every quarter far to, or every yearly to the Kepa. Six, every six months I report to Kepa, and every quarter I have to report to the Japanese lenders. So there's a very, you know, they, very, they do keep a lot of, um, observation on exactly what my emission limits are and as I say we have the very lowest I think some of the lowest in Kuwait I'd like to say the lowest in Kuwait apart from solar which obviously has no no emissions Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, with regards to the uh, tariff rate um, it's you said it's a com index or a combination of uh, indices what about I read in the your presentation there are some issues related to expenses are these like recovered um, like by W, like you incur them, they recover them, through, uh, buy them, like you charge them, or do you include it in their tariff rate? So, you know, by years of, you know, as it goes like three years, maybe there's like, you know, inflation, increasing costs and whatever. Isn't it already like um, reimbursed in your tariff rate? Yes, it is, but don't forget, uh, uh, when we win the project, when we won the project in 2013, there's a base rate tariff, yeah, and prices go up over the years, so it's, it's natural and fair that, you know, your, your labour costs increase over the years, your material costs increase, in line with, with uh, contractual indexation uh, clauses, you know. We, we actually agree on what the indexation levels are, and every year we, we talk to MEW and we agree what the indexation um, reconciliations are. So again, it's all very, very transparent as to, as to where our, our costs go. So let's say your base year is 100 for your index. Correct. Your next year, let's say it will be 101.5. Correct. So you basically have the expenses budgeted at, let's say, a 1.5 increase, 1.5 percent increase. And so it's your, your tariff rate is linked also to your operating expenses, your cost of production. It is, it is, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the both mirrored on the cost and on the revenue side. Mm -hmm. You're quite right. There's no... The, the intention is not to have any, any gain on indexation, put it that way. You're 100% you're right. right. The revenues and the cost are both indexed at the same levels. You're quite right. Thank you. Mr. Paul, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Uh, نهاية نشكر حضوركم الكريم وإن شاء الله نلتقيكم ندوات قادمة يعطيكم العافية <تصفيق>